Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my July 2020 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. I did a couple of readathons this month, including the Fuckathon, which I managed to do every prompt for, except for the very last one and the group book, because I didn't have access to it. The very last one, I'm currently reading it. I started it yesterday, and I could have finished it and then recorded this video, but I wanted to record this video before it got too hot out. This is the kind of behind-the-scenes thinking you get in the middle of summer. Hi friends, it's Kathy from Editing, here to tell you that I forgot to put a book on my spreadsheet, which means that all of these stats are just slightly wrong, but not wrong enough that I feel like I'm going to have to redo them. Just know that I ended up finishing 27 books this month. There you go. I'm going to start with the nerdy hardcore stats and charts and then get into what I read. In July, I read a total of 26 books for a total of 7,528 pages. Who let me do this? That takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages, so about 2,609 of those pages were actually about 65 hours of audio. The age breakdown for these books was 16 adult books and 10 YA books. I read 18 novels, 5 graphic novels, and 3 anthologies. This month my reading was all over the place, with contemporary non-fiction and fantasy taking up the biggest chunks of the pie, followed by spec fic, mystery thriller, poetry, science fiction, romance, and historical fiction. If you adjust by page count, not much changes. This month, most of my reads came from the library, but I also read some ARCs, some items I purchased through Kindle, and one book from a friend. I read 16 ebooks, 8 audiobooks, 1 hardcover, and 1 paperback. Nearly half of these were in the 300 to 399 pages range, and all of them were published in the last decade. More than half of these authors were female, with some male authors, mixed titles, and non-binary authors as well. As for protagonist genders, they were all over the spectrum. In terms of setting, most of these books took place in the United States, with others set in the UK, Qatar, Sweden, Iceland, and other worlds. In terms of diversity, there was queer rep, books that were intersectional in their representation, and books to do with race, disability, mental health, feminism, and a few you with no discernible representation. In terms of star ratings, this month I read one 2.5 star read, two 3 star reads, four 3.5 star reads, seven 4 star reads, six 4.5 star reads, and six 5 star reads. Let's start with my lowest rated read and work our way up to the highest, shall we? My 2.5 star read this month was by Neil Gaiman, and it was How to Talk to Girls at Parties, specifically the graphic novel edition of this. If I were rating this based solely on the art, it would get a much higher rating because the art in this graphic novel was absolutely beautiful. And I do understand that what is trying to take place in this is we're trying to talk about how men are from Mars and women are from Venus and taking that idea a little bit further and how it's harder to talk to the gender that you are attracted to when you're younger because hormones and all of these types of things. However, this either didn't make a lot of sense, or it wasn't supposed to make a lot of sense, or I just didn't understand it, and the ending could be misconstrued as a transphobic ending, so it just was not for me. On to my three star reads, the first one being I Am Not Your Final Girl. This is a poetry collection about final girls from a bunch of movies that, unfortunately, I haven't seen most of. A lot of this was lost on me because each of these poems was based after a female character in a horror movie, and I couldn't find the way to connect with it so much because I spent too much time thinking about how I didn't know the reference and I didn't know who this character was, so that was a problem for me. However, it does really make me want to watch all of the movies and then read the corresponding poem right afterwards, so I'm going to look in to see if I can actually have access to these movies and see what I can do about that. My other three-star read is Everything is Beautiful and I'm Not Afraid. This is a graphic novel about this person who is from China but lives in the United States and she's bisexual and there's a lot of intersections in this graphic novel. It's a very basic art style which is totally fine by me. Not everything has to be over the top, like obviously I love Sarah's scribbles. So the three stars didn't so much to do with the art as it is that I didn't feel that impacted by what was going on in this. It wasn't a through narrative, it was basically just kind of ideas of different things had come up in her life, and I enjoyed it while I was reading it, but none of it really stuck with me. One of my 3.5 star reads, the first one being Bury the Lead, which was another graphic novel. I honestly can't remember too much about this. The art in it was absolutely gorgeous, so I loved that. I love that we had queer rep and diversity in the different characters that we had. This was basically about someone who is starting out as a journalist, and a big case happens, and for whatever reason she's in the middle of it. I didn't really care about the case too much, 
So that's probably why this isn't sticking with me too much besides being like, oh, these queer characters got together and that was nice. Next, we have the care and feeding of ravenously hungry girls. I read this at the very beginning of the month, so I can't remember fine details very well. Besides, this is about a couple who own a diner and they were doing some form of shady dealing. So at the beginning of the book, they are in jail and we don't know why and we don't know the circumstances around it. And as this book goes on, you realize it's somewhat of a family saga and it's about all of the different things that have happened to these different siblings over time and how they ended up in jail and how people are coping with that and who basically put them in jail. It's somebody from within the family. There are a lot of different family dynamics there are a lot of different topics discussed, so there are trigger warnings for people being homophobic, there's trigger warnings for eating disorders, and if you like complicated interpersonal stories with lots of fascinating characters, this is one to pick up. The sun is gonna start doing weird things now, isn't it? Oh, it knows I'm filming. Next we have An Embarrassment of Witches. This is another graphic novel about this girl who has basically just finished college and is meant to be going to Australia with her boyfriend so they can work basically a kind of a volunteerism thing to do with dragons because of course this has to do with magic, it's a magical world. But right at the very beginning we are in the airport with her and her boyfriend and her boyfriend has basically just said, yeah, so when we get there we're gonna see other people, right? And she's like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, no, we're opening up the relationship. And she's like, we've literally never talked talked about this and you're talking about this in the middle of the airport? Like, what? So long story short, she doesn't end up going with that dickhead, but that does mean that she's hiding with her best friend from her mom, who her best friend happens to work for, because her mom always thinks that she's going to screw things up and she doesn't want to give her mom any more ammunition. This was all about finding yourself in different life choices and trying not to be too self-centered and actually notice when your best friend is going through some things, and it was fun. Hi, Kathy from Editing here to let you know that I missed a graphic novel. Somehow I didn't put it on my spreadsheet, so it's not part of any of the stats I did earlier, but I do want to talk about it. And this is where it goes as far as where I'm ranking it for the month. That is called Blackbird. It is about this girl who's, when she's about 10 years old, predicts this natural disaster that's going to happen and her family doesn't take her very seriously. And then it happens and she sees this big magical being and then everyone else forgets about it except for her. She goes on with her life trying to find out about magic. The art style is absolutely stunning, so read it just for that, but then there's also some twists and turns that I think you'll find interesting. Sorry for this. Damn it, previous Kathy, for not having her shit together. Let's go on with the rest of the wrap-up. Next we have The Darkness, which is the first in a crime thriller series. This book is about a protagonist who's near the end of her career because she's a woman in the police force and it's very much a boys club. She hasn't really made a lot of friends there, but she still really enjoys her work. When one day her boss basically says that she's being forced into early retirement because they've already hired her replacement and they want her desk. She's given the chance to take a look into one old cold case to see if she can solve it before she's kicked off the force. I really liked this one. The morals were definitely gray. We got to see an older woman dating, which you don't see very often. And I definitely didn't see that ending coming. So if you've read this first book in this series and you want to talk about it, hit me up. On to my four star reads, the first one being Heavy Vinyl Y2KO. This is the second volume in the Heavy Vinyl graphic novel series. This one takes place just before we're going to hit Y2K. If you were born after Y2K, you might not even know what that is. Since this is a second in a series and there is a pretty big secret in the first one, I'm not going to talk too much about the plot, but this is about a group of girls that work in a record store. Some of them are queer, which is wonderful. Some of the other ones have relationships that are changing and uh, they are in a band together and that's all I'm going to tell you it's wonderful. I also read No Man of Woman Born. This is a fantasy short story collection where all of the main characters are trans and or non-binary. The central thesis around these short stories is that you're looking at different tropes in fantasy and how they could have been done better if you just acknowledge the fact that non-binary and trans people exist, and I really liked it for that. I enjoyed reading these stories. Another anthology I read is The Other F Word. This is all about fat acceptance and it has about 30 different authors in it, so there's very essays and poetry and art and it was just a very enjoyable read. Next we have an arc of a book that isn't out until September and that's Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. When I first started reading this I thought that the title should have been Insufferable Assholes because everybody, the police officers, are trying to interview about this robbery, gone very awry, was just insufferable. 
However, by the end of the book, I ended up really liking most of the characters, so I'm pretty sure that that was kind of the point. This book is about a lot of things and there's a lot of subplots, so I'm going to try to be very brief with this, but essentially this is about a person who has gone through some hard times, tries to go rob a bank, that doesn't go well, so they are trying to escape the police, they run into an apartment building and they end up holding a group full of people hostage who are there for a viewing for the apartment. This book is told through us looking at these different characters both in the apartment and the cops and things that have happened to the characters in the apartment at different times in their lives, as well as when people are being interviewed at the police station after the hostage situation. Because this does choose to jump around in the timeline, we learn a lot about these characters, so even though some of them just aren't great people, you grow to enjoy them and understand them more over the course of the novel, which was fascinating because initially I was like, oh, everybody is terrible in this book, and it's not like I can't read a book where people are terrible, obviously that has happened, but it's just a weird choice to make unless you're going to do something like this book did. Hello, son. Goodbye, son. This month I also read A Curse So Dark and Lonely. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling that is very interesting. I think it's the first Beauty and the Beast retelling that I've actually read. And this one is interesting because the Beauty is a girl from our world who has cerebral palsy and is down on her luck and her family really needs money because her mother is sick and her dad has run off and he had loan sharks so now the loan sharks want to get the money from the family so her brother is working for some very not nice people. And then our Beast character is living in this completely separate world where he's reliving the same season over and over again, and in this season he's trying to get at least one woman to fall in love with him to break this curse, because eventually he turns into a different creature and murders a bunch of people in his kingdom. I thought this was a really interesting Beauty and the Beast retelling. It really played with the Beauty and the Beast, because we're not given this girl that's prim and proper and everything is fine with her life. We're given basically the opposite, and then we are given this beast who's not already a beast but is going to turn into one, and then he's got this best friend who is basically the only person left to work for him, and there's kind of a love triangle, and many things happened. I'm going to have to continue the series because I was very much amused by this. Next we have All Boys Aren't Blue, which is a memoir by George M. Johnson, which is all about his life growing up queer and black, and the many intersections of that experience. This was very interesting because we really got to know a lot of these real people from his past and his present and these different situations, and I really felt for what was going on. There are trigger warnings in this, there is homophobia in this, there is child abuse in this. He does talk about the sexual assault that was perpetrated upon him. And I need to stop using him when referring to them because even though those were the pronouns used in the book, they quite recently just came out as using they, them pronouns. As in yesterday. Yesterday they literally just posted that they are now using they, them pronouns, so my apologies for that. This month I also read Magic for Liars. I knew nothing about this book going into it, and I was so pleasantly surprised with this whole thing. This is another mystery thriller type of thing where our main character is a private detective, and she is hired to solve a murder, or at least somebody thinks it's a murder. It's been investigated and ruled an accident, but the dean of the school where the incident took place doesn't think it was an accident. This is further complicated by the fact that our main character's sister works at this school, and they haven't really spoken very much in the past few years, mostly because our main character doesn't have magic, but her sister does, and that kind of formed a rift in their relationship in their teens. I was about four hours into this audiobook, which I was very much enjoying because the narrator was just fantastic, and then I accidentally returned it to the library and panicked because there was a two-month waiting list on the audiobook, so I ended up having to finish it by downloading the ebook also from the library, which fortunately was available because I needed to know what was going to happen. Something I very much appreciated about this book is even though these teenagers at this high school have magic, they are still very much teenagers, so if they're going to do magic magical graffiti, it's going to be magical graffiti of dicks, obviously. I very much like the voice of the main character, and I am very much looking forward to reading more by this author. One of my 4.5 star reads, the first one being The Black Flamingo. This is an entire novel written in poetry, and it goes by so quickly because of that. This crosses over so much with All Boys Aren't Blue, with the exception of this character is in the UK and George M. Johnson is from the United States. It's all about this character growing up mixed race and queer and eventually getting to college and finding out about drag and what that means for identity and having first sexual experiences and what that means, and it was, again, 
wonderful, obviously. It's this far on the list, I recommend it. Next we have How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kennedy. This is a collection of essays about Ibram's time growing up and how they have tackled their own racism and what that means. Because we're often fed the line that black people can't be racist when in fact they can perpetuate racist ideas and racist stereotypes, and most importantly racist organizations and systems. I am never going to be able to sum up this book in a satisfactory way because there were a lot of different points of race theory in this that I do not want to misconstrue. I just want to say that this was a very insightful tool that definitely made me think, and it should be something on everyone's anti-racism reading list. Next we have Only Mostly Devastated, which is a male-male romance retelling of Greece. Somehow, going into this book, I had either forgotten it was queer or didn't know in the first place that it was queer, so that was a wonderful little thing for me to find out. This book is about Ollie, whose family has relocated for the summer because his aunt has fallen sick with cancer, so he is basically watching her kids, and his mom and dad are basically helping out with the aunt's cancer treatments. When the school year rolls around, his parents basically go, I know it's your senior year, but your aunt still needs help, so I think we're going to stay, and how could he say no to that? This would be way, way better, however, if the boy he'd been seeing all summer would just text him back, because they said they were gonna keep in touch, and then he just didn't. I think that Greece is enough of a cultural phenomenon that you probably know what happens from there, and all I can say is, like the best retellings, this took elements of the original, heightened them, and then built on them, and I very much enjoyed it for that. This month I had the extreme pleasure of buddy reading Phoenix Extravagant with my friend Audrey, which was just a great experience. They read with such passion and care and attention to detail that reading anything alongside them is just so heightened and even more interesting, and they point out things I miss all the time, which is just great. Our non-binary protagonist Jebby is living in an area of the world that has been colonized by other people, and they basically just want to get a job with the government doing their art so they can make money. Their sister, who is very much anti-colonialism, finds out that they are trying to do this, as well as the fact that they changed their name to fit the naming scheme of the colonists, and basically is not very happy about it, and it causes some strife. It's hard for me to give more of a synopsis than that, because there are so many little twists and turns of things that I absolutely love in this book that I just want everyone to go into it knowing it's going to be great, you're going to love it, and then talk to me once you've read it. This also has such a great mixture of science and fantasy in such weird and interesting ways, where if you were to write some of the things that happen in this book outside of those contexts, I would be like, that doesn't make any sense and that's silly. But within this world, I'm okay with it. This month I also read my first Tessa Dare book, and that was The Duchess Deal. I laughed so hard reading this book, especially at the very beginning. So, this book starts out with this duke who needs a wife because he just needs to produce an heir, because he doesn't want his estate to go to a cousin or something like that, because they're not great people, so he has to produce an heir. However, he was injured in a war, so he does have some scarring because of that, and he was supposed to get married to somebody, but she basically said, ah, uh, no, and left him. And we hate her. As he's writing a letter to try to figure out how he can get a wife, a girl walks in wearing a wedding dress. It turns out that this is the seamstress who is hired to make the wedding dress for the wedding that didn't happen, and she wants to be paid for her work. This book had me at the moment when he looked at the dress and called it unicorn vomit. Whew. Not because her skills were lacking, but because the person he was meant to marry had very questionable taste. This was sexy and fun, and they spent a lot of time teasing each other, and I just very much enjoyed it, and now I'm going to have to read all the rest of this author's work. It feels like that's just the rule now. I just have to. This month I did another edition of my Spectacular Standalones, where I read an entire book and update you after every single chapter as to what's going on in the chapter and my feelings on it, and that book was The Weight of the Stars. Unfortunately, this is another book where the chapters are about two pages long, so that reading vlog is an hour. Not unfortunately, however, this book was amazing and it made me cry, and you get to see it in that vlog. This book is about Ryan Bird, who lives in a trailer with her younger nonverbal brother and his son, and she kind of collects people at school who are misfits, 
and basically befriends them. And a teacher has given her the task of befriending this new student who she soon finds out is somewhat of a celebrity. I could go on and on about the intricacies of this plot and everything about it that made me cry, but instead I want you to go watch my spectacular standalone vlog. On to my five star reads, the first one being my reread of Me and White Supremacy. This is a very step-by-step -step process of going through these different topics that have to do with white supremacy, thinking about them in a lot of detail, and then journaling through these different prompts at the end of every chapter. A few years ago, this started out as an Instagram challenge and has since grown into this book. I say reread because I read this earlier in the year. This is the second time I've read it this year, and I've decided I'm going to reread it every July until the end of my time here. If you're the type of person that's caught up on terminology and you don't feel like you have a great foundation for anti-racism work, this is a wonderful place to start. Next, I read Pride by E.B. Zaboy, which is a retelling of Pride and Prejudice. You should know by now, I'm not a big fan of classics, but I love classic retellings, and this one was amazing. Obviously, because I gave it five stars. This retelling takes place in Brooklyn, and it's about the Benitez family, as well as the Darcy family, who have just moved in across the street and have basically revamped the building across the street to just be their McMansion. This book is about gentrification and the initial prejudice people have towards you because of your economic status, the color of your skin, all of these different types of things. The audiobook is also narrated by Elizabeth Acevedo, which is just so good, especially because our main character also writes poetry, so you know that the poetry parts are just spot on because Elizabeth Acevedo herself is a spoken word poet and so good. <laughs> this month I also read Good Talk, a memoir in conversations. This is about a journalist who is essentially having conversations with her son and her white husband and what all of these things mean when they're living in America and racial tensions are growing. This is from a couple of years ago and I can only imagine the conversations they're having now. It's pretty fortunate that I listened to a very big portion of this book while I was driving in a car by myself because there were so many microaggressions that I latched onto and just screamed about. Especially in the section where she was talking about colorism. She happens to have the darkest skin of her family, so she has aunts and uncles who are constantly trying to get her to have less dark skin, and it's just... I wanted to throw my phone on the road, but obviously did not. This month I also read All American Muslim Girl. This is about a protagonist whose mom growing up was Catholic, I believe, and her dad growing up was Muslim, but later kind of got a little bit more lax on that. Her father's family is Sarcasian, so they tend to have much lighter skin than people we tend to associate with being Muslim, so she is white passing and nobody she goes to school with knows that she's Muslim. What I liked most about this book is it was the story of a person who is getting close closer and closer to the faith of her parents, which is the opposite of what we tend to see in YA books. It tends to be that the parents are super religious and the child wants to break away from that, but in this case the parents are not very religious, they're religious kind of in name only because they don't feel a very strong connection to it, and she feels a very strong connection to it and wants to learn more about her religion and start going to prayer meetings and that type of thing. We also have this extra layer of she starts dating this boy who is very, very cute, but it turns out that his father is not a very nice person when we come to talking about the Muslim population in America. This was recommended by my friend Sajed. I highly recommend that you also read it. This one also had a lot of little microaggressions that made me want to throw things. So if a book can get me that upset about things, that's a pretty good indication as to why it's near the top of this list. Our penultimate book is Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, which is a remix of Stamped from the Beginning by Ibra. Max Kendi, who I talked about previously. This one is written by Jason Reynolds. I haven't read Stamped from the beginning, so I can't tell you how these two compare. I'm going to assume, based on what I read earlier from Ibram, that it is much more of a textbook type of writing style, but I don't know that for sure. This one is a much more conversational style written by Jason Reynolds, and the audiobook is also narrated by him, so everything is in his own words. R.I.P. my camera battery, gotta charge the spare. <laughs> this is a quick history of racism dating back to the first slave traders and who we've decided is the world's first racist, all the way up to present day with a lot of conversations about things that I had never heard of before, especially because a lot of this is US-centric and I am not from the United States, but I have heard of a bunch of these things or a bunch of these people but just didn't know the depth to which 
they affect society. This book was incredibly accessible, so if you're looking to expand your anti-racism reading list, put this book on there. The last book for this video, my very favorite book of this month, is one I'm not going to be able to say too much about because it's a sequel, and that's A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor by Hank Green. As This is the second in the duology. Obviously, I can't tell you much about the plot because it ruins the plot of the first book. In the first book, we are following a girl named April May who one day stumbles out of her job really late and finds this statue on the street of New York. And like most people, she's about to just walk by it and be like, ah, oh, another weird New York thing. But because she has an art background, she's like, no, this is remarkable. I'm going to make a YouTube video about it. So she calls down her friend Andy, they make a video, she goes to sleep. In the morning, she's woken up to the news that that video has gone viral because not only is there one statue like this, there are 64 statues across the world that look exactly like this, and they all showed up at the exact same time. I'm trying to figure out exactly what I can tell you about this second book that will not spoil things. Um, one thing I can tell you is that although the first book was written from April May's perspective, this book is written from multiple perspectives, so we get a lot of the side stories that April May was leaving out because she's a very self-centered character. And a lot of the themes that we explore in the first book are just turned up to 11 in the second book. I highly enjoyed this. I listened to the audiobook from my library, and before I had even finished it, I went and spent full price hardcover book money on my own copy so that I can tab the series up, which is something I've never done before, but I'm going to. I loved getting the perspective of these characters. I loved being constantly surprised by how the plot was moving on. I loved the whole new component that was introduced in this and what that means about the internet and culture and humanity and obviously, I recommend it, you just need to read the first book first. If you want to hear me talk more about these books, or other books for that matter, the link to my weekly entertainment playlist is always linked down below. If you've read any of these, please let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you're on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to support me in this time, so I recently set up a coffee account, which is like a digital tipping service. That link is down below, as well as the link to my PayPal and my Amazon wishlist in case you want to send me a book. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye!